as I've been preparing for these, uh, these weeks in this teaching series on the seven deadly sins, um, as, as I'm preparing for that, I've been pulling from uh, a number of things from study from several years ago. When we lived in Calgary, there was twice that I was part of a team who, uh, who taught through the seven deadly sins uh, in two different churches. And so as I've been preparing this, I've gone back to those and pulled uh, some of the good things and the contents and some of the, that kind of stuff from uh, both of those times. And so uh, Ryan and Matt and uh, Stu and Eric and Ron and Tim and Jeff, uh, I want to say thank you to them because they were all part of uh, those things that help shape what we're doing today. So they'll probably never hear this or hear me said that, but I want to make sure we give credit where credit is due. But as we go deeper into this series, week in and week out, I'm starting to, to really realize more and more that I struggle with this stuff a lot more than I thought I did. Anybody else kind of feel the same way? Um, I... I I want us to, to really take these things seriously, to understand the depths of these. And even if there's little things, they, they lay seeds that grow into monsters. And I want us to be able to take them seriously. All of them are um, the really internal root work that suck the life out of us. And they lead to destruction. They lead to, to death and they kill joy. In the book of Job, right near the beginning, as life completely becomes destroyed for him, it says in chapter 4 that jealousy and envy um, bring destruction and they kill life. And I think we see that. We see that with all of these seven deadly sins. But you know what? There is freedom. There is freedom. Next week we'll be halfway through and I'll take a few minutes at the beginning and we'll kind of recap and, and review some of that kind of stuff. But a couple of weeks ago we talked about pride. And we all see this in each other's lives or specifically in that person or that person. We see pride like crazy and nobody likes it in anybody else. But it's so hard to see in ourselves. Last week we looked at greed. And again, um, greed, we see it in other people. And we don't like it. But it's really hard to get my head wrapped around that that's me too. And maybe not to, uh, to a full degree, but there's elements of these things in all of us. So we need to study these things so that we can find freedom. That we can find freedom because these things kill us. They destroy us. And so what I'd like us to do as we've looked at this and we have a few more weeks coming is let's really understand these things. These things called the seven deadly sins. Let's really understand them so that we can uh, examine ourselves so that we can bring these things into the light and, and expose them and uncover them. That allows us, when we run to Jesus, to find freedom and forgiveness in repentance. And to find freedom and to find life from these things that are sucking the life out of us. The, the very, very first sin that's recorded in the Bible, the first sin that's, that's recorded in human history, what is that? Adam and uh, Cain and Abel, what is it? I'm hearing a whole bunch of different things here. Murder. Abel was a shepherd. Cain tilled the ground, grew crops. And, and both of them in that story in Genesis chapter 4, both of them brought their offerings to God as they were instructed. And they both brought their first fruits of, of their work. That's what God had asked. But it says there that with Cain and his offering, God was not pleased. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up, I don't know whether I was always taught or whether I just assumed 
that it was his offering that God was not pleased with. Because Abel brought a lamb. And Cain brought fruit and crops. But you know what? He brought exactly what God asked him to bring. The first fruits of their labor. So what was it? And when you read that, it actually says, but with Cain and his offering, God was not pleased. What did this do to Cain? All of a sudden, what's going on in Cain's mind? Cain starts seeing his brother Abel. And if he's like us, we can probably assume that he's comparing himself to his brother. And that starts to fester because he got accepted. Well, he's God's favorite, right? God liked him. And, and then what, what happened in him started as a little thing and grew and festered and became murder. But where did that start? It started with envy. And in the middle of it, God even comes in when, when, when uh, Cain started feeling that towards his brother God even comes into the conversation there and says, what's going on? Why are you so bent out of shape? God comes in really gently to enter in a conversation, I'm sure, hopefully, to help Cain get this together and sort it out and move forward. Cain didn't listen, and it festered and grew into murder. The problem, though, was envy. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus talks about this same thing. And, and Jesus tells a story, a parable, to, to make a point. And he says, uh, there, there was a, a man who had a vineyard, and it was harvest time, so he went and hired a bunch of workers for the day. Early in the morning, he hired them, agreed with them that this would be your wage for the day. Partway through the day, he needed more workers. He went and got more, and he made an agreement with them. Here's how much I'll pay you. Work the rest of the day. The problem was he paid the guys who worked half a day just the same as he paid the guys who worked the full day. And the guys who started first thing in the morning, of course, get bent out of shape because, well, how come we're working a full day for this and they're working a half day for this? What is his response? Well, didn't we shake hands and make an agreement? You were happy with what you're getting paid? I did the same with them. But what is it? What's the issue here? The issue is... The guys who started first were mad that they got a better deal. What's happening here? This is envy. Do you ever feel like this? I know I do. Do you know the frustration or maybe the, the resentful feelings that come when someone else has good fortune or when someone else gets a promotion or when someone else gets a new car, or recognition, and why them? Why not me? Do those things agitate you? I'm assuming they do, because they agitate me. Because they either really get under our skin and agitate us, or... In the purity and honesty, it's, wow, I'm happy for them. And I know some people that are like that by default. That it just it doesn't jump to envy. It jumps to, wow, I'm really happy for them. I want to be like that. How about you? But this is the way things are. And when it agitates us, seeds are planted that are just as dangerous as any of the other seven deadly sins. It's envy. The painful and often resentful awareness of the advantage enjoyed by someone else. So why is envy one of the deadly sins? It seems like such a little thing in a lot of ways. It doesn't seem like it's nearly as bad as some of the others. Why is it so dangerous? We all know it and we all feel it. But like others in the list, it's a deep internal attitude that can quickly grow and spread. And when it's allowed to simmer, it grows and it boils over and it becomes resenting anything good that happens to somebody else. 
Envy causes us to criticize people. And, and envy envy's close to its cousin pride and greed, which we did the last couple of weeks. Envy weighs and ranks and compares and makes our neighbors into competitors instead of friends. And we often find ourselves then getting frustrated with anything good they experience. And, and, and when we experience something good, it becomes something we want to brag about so everybody knows. Because it's a competition now. Rather than something good happens and we generously share. Yesterday on Facebook, I don't know who posted this, and when I snapped my screenshot, I didn't get any of the credit, so I can't credit properly. But yesterday on Facebook, somebody posted this. And it's, comparison is the thief of joy. Isn't that true? This is the work of the silent but deadly envy. It's when somebody enjoys something good in their life. A coworker gets a promotion even though we were next in line. Or the neighbor who pulls up in their brand new car where, well, I'm still driving a 2008 truck. It's, it's the, the friend who goes on an amazing adventure for the summer while you're stuck cleaning cottages on the weekends. That person got an advantage, and it bugs me. Anybody ever have a hard time with that? You don't have to put up your hand. We clearly need to talk about this, just like all the rest. But as I said, I want us to understand envy. I want us to, oh, to, to be able to examine ourselves, and then expose it, uncover it, get it out into the light, deal with it. Walk the way... Jesus walked, to understand his perspective and find freedom and change. And, and just like the last couple of weeks, we look in the mirror and we see ourselves. So let's stop and take the spotlight off of ourselves and put it on somebody else. All right? Isn't that the easy way to do it? If you have a Bible, go to 1 Samuel chapter uh, 16, 17, and 18. We're actually going to look at 18 uh, today. But in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, we're introduced to a young man who uh, we can assume is somewhere around 15 to 18 years old. We don't know exactly, but that's what historians kind of assume. His name is David, and he is a young shepherd. He is a musician. He's totally unassuming. He's the youngest in a family full of boys. And... Um, He's about to step into a huge adventure. He's about to become famous, really famous. And he's going to move up the ranks in the nation really quickly. From absolutely obscure to standing shoulder to shoulder with the king. So King Saul is the king then. And he absolutely goes bonkers with this situation. We'll see that in the story today as we read that. Um, so God tells Samuel the prophet that um, it's time to anoint a new king. He won't become king yet, but it's time for God to show who that's going to be. And tells him it's from the family of Jesse. So Samuel travels to Jesse's home, and they call out all the boys. And where does he start? He starts with the oldest, the most capable, the best looking, the, the brightest, sharpest, and works his way down, one by one by one by one, and God's saying, nope, 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 until he gets through all of the boys. And Samuel says, is there no more? He says, well, there's David. Go get him. Think about this. In all appearances, in all understanding, David is the least qualified. He's the furthest one from the list of who's going to be the next king. But God looks at the heart. We find out very soon that Saul has issues and is going to hire a musician. He has anger issues and he gets all stirred up and worked up. And so he hires a part-time musician to come and play soothing music. And guess who gets that job? David gets that job. 
And so here David goes very quickly from absolute obscurity, shepherd in the wilderness with his father's sheep, to part-time job in the palace. After he's been anointed the next king. Okay, put yourself into a 16 or 18-year-old kid's head. You've been anointed the next king. And two weeks later, you got a part-time job in the palace. And this is unpacking pretty quick, right? So, um, David quickly moves up the ranks here. And he goes back and forth. Uh, from the palace to home, and then we come to chapter 17. And in chapter 17, there's war, and David goes to take care of his brothers and bring them some lunch, and finds out about Goliath, and almost everybody in the world knows the story of David and Goliath, um, how uh, this is an unbeatable enemy, he's making a mockery of the entire nation. David ends up stepping up to the front lines of war and killing Goliath, in his courage, in his youthful ignorance, in his trust for God. And this, this springs the envy in Saul's heart. Pick up the story in chapter 18, verse 5. David works for Saul still. Even though he's killed Goliath, he's still the musician playing for Saul. In chapter 18, verse 5, whenever Saul, whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. Remember, he's just a kid. Everything he touches turns to gold. And, and, and Saul sets him up as a commander in his army, and the officers love this. He's still working for Saul. All is good because the nation is at peace. And we've won this battle and this taunter. that It's gone. It's over. And Saul is loving the time of success and victory. David is doing well, so he rises David up and it's all good. Now, verse 6. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David killed the Philistine... This would have been very normal. Uh, there would have been a victory parade as the army came back. The king would be leading the parade on a white horse, and people would come out and sing and dance. And um, This is what's happening here. They're coming home, and women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. He is the great victorious king. All right, you get the picture? They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals, and this was their song. Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. What's happening in Saul? Can you see it? Something's happening in Saul. Um, something flips in him. Look at verse 8. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next, they'll make him king. And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. You see what's happening in Saul's heart? It, it, it could have gone either way. David won a, a great battle for the kingdom, which could have made Saul more secure more victorious, more happy, more vibrant, thriving, or it becomes a threat to Saul. We see envy take root in Saul's heart. And envy robs us of joy. We see it here. Envy robs us of joy. Saul had everything to be thankful for. He had success as a king. He had years of success. And, and he became king, and he didn't deserve to be king. So think about that. I'm just a guy. I'm taller than everybody else. They made me king, and he tried to hide. He didn't want him. But look at this life he's got now. He's got everything he ever wanted, and there was years of God's blessing on him and on his nation. He had it all. Saul, what are you thinking? 
But all of a sudden, he could no longer see the blessing. He could no longer see how good things were. He could no longer see victory and, 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 and joy. He became absolutely focused on what he was being robbed of and what he didn't have. He took his eyes off what God had given him and put them onto what God was giving somebody else. Not what I have, but what I don't have. When Saul should have been celebrating God's goodness and a great victory because God showed up, he should have been celebrating. And, and, and his best man, now his commander of his armies, had won this battle. This should have been brilliant celebration. He should be thriving and happy and generously sharing in the bounty of what God did. Nope. It stewed in his heart. It began to fester. And he couldn't even think. He couldn't even see the good things that were happening. And, and so you see what happens here? You see what happens here? It robs him of joy, but then something else. That simple comparing, that feeling threatened, made the envy grow. And envy always grows. And here, it grows out of control. If you look at my front yard, we live at Sobel, it's hard to grow grass. But if you look at my front yard from the road, it really looks nice. It's green. There's a consistency. But if you look up close, we have a clover issue. We have these creeping violets that are all the way through it and taking over more and more. Now we've got this new weed that's spreading like crazy. And if I keep it cut and keep it watered, it looks pretty good. But don't look up close. And, and I've tried overseeding and overseeding and overseeding and overseeding and making it just, let's get more and more and more grass. And hopefully, you know what? If I'm ever going to deal with these issues that are really there, I need something way more drastic. I can't help but think that that works on my lawn exactly like envy works in my heart. And from a distance, we can make it look really good. And it might even drive me towards greater success and achievement. But if I'm really going to deal with it, it's going to require something a lot more drastic. Yoda. Everybody knows who Yoda is, right? Yoda said, and I won't do the voice. Actually, Jackson can do the voice really well. Uh, Yoda said, envy leads to jealousy. Jealousy, jealousy leads to hate. Hate leads to anger, and anger leads to the dark side. Sin is not passive. Envy is not passive. It grows and it spreads. Where do we leave off? Verse 10. In verse 9 it said, So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Verse 10, the very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul and, began, and he began to rave in, his, rave in his house like a madman. That's not rave like dance. It's rave like rage. He was living like a madman in his house and David was playing his harp just like he did every day. But Saul had a spear in his hand, hand and suddenly hurled at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. Not just once, twice. Saul did that. So what's happened in Saul? How did it all of a sudden get like that? It was the next day. What was uh, annoying turned to, to stewing and simmering, turned to rage, turned to violence, and turned to attempted murder. Go back to Cain and Abel. God even comes in to Cain. And whispers in his ear, let's straighten this out, what's got you all worked up. But he doesn't listen. He refuses to actually let God do his work in him. And it festered quickly out of control. It took over. One of the pastors I worked with out west, who, who is part of this teaching thing, um, he said, 
Envy grows most in proximity. Envy grows most in proximity to others. Here's what he means by that. If you're a kid growing up playing hockey, you don't probably envy the world's greatest hockey player. Who we envy is the guy down the bench who scores more goals. Right? It's, it's the ones we see in proximity, the ones we're closest to. As they succeed, we become envious. It's, it's the kid who's on the same ice as us, not the, the NHL player. If we're in business, we don't envy the multi-billionaire from downtown New York. No, we envy the guy whose desk is next to mine who seems to keep getting the better sales. We envy the guy who graduated right in front of me in line, who seems to be succeeding more than I am. We envy people in proximity. And that's what's happened to Saul. He says, this guy's not a hero. He's my harp player. And this, this envy, this seed, became an obsession to Saul. It ate away at him. It destroyed his life. It killed his joy. It, it spun the whole rest of his life into the garbage can. This is what envy does. But there is a better way. There is a better way. Saul and David on opposite ends of the spectrum here. But look in the middle, because there's a third character in this story. His name is Jonathan. Jonathan is Saul's son, and he is brave and strong. As we read some of these chapters, we see that he is trained and he is skillful. And you can just picture, he's the king's son, and Saul, lots of days, probably puts his armor on his son and says, look, one day this will all be yours. You see what Jonathan is growing up in. And yet, when David comes on the scene... Naturally, it would become competitive, right? Naturally, as David is rising in, in, in fame um, and been anointed as king, wouldn't Solomon or wouldn't um, Jonathan all of a sudden then be threatened, rising up in power? Look at the beginning of that chapter, chapter 18, verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. He could keep his eye on him then. And Saul made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. And Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe, giving it to David in his tunic and his sword and his bow and his belt. This solemn pact. Here's what's going on in Jonathan's mind. Jonathan, who's in line to be the next king, is saying, look at David. He is so amazing. Do you know somebody like that? Can't do anything wrong? Succeeds at everything? Our default is, Ugh. right? Jonathan sees that in somebody else and doesn't do the, he, he pours into it. He comes alongside to make the guy even better. And this little action of taking off his tunic uh, and his sword and his belt and giving it to David, that's an act of submission. That's an act of, of laying myself aside and honoring somebody. Get the picture? Here's a guy that should be a threat to everything about Saul, of, of Jonathan's future. And Jonathan is not threatened. Jonathan leans in. To fan that fire. Isn't that a different perspective? Instead of envy, he's filled with love. Instead of envy, he supports it even more. Saul, on one hand, had no reason to be threatened. He had it all. He had no reason to be threatened, and he was completely threatened. Jonathan had every reason to be threatened and wasn't. And he had everything to lose. Here's what I see in Jonathan that I don't see in his dad. Number one, 
Jonathan saw the bigger picture. He saw through God's eyes. Last week, if you were here, we talked about the long view, the eternal perspective. And our life, if we could look at our life just through, through the narrow, small, today view, things look very different. Priorities are very different. When we look at my life through all of eternity, priorities are really different. If I look at my life through all of eternity, then position and power and prestige and stuff really doesn't matter. This is how Jonathan was looking at this. Because he trusts in God's plan, he trusts in God's care, he trusts in God's future, he builds up others rather than pulling them down. Seeing his life from God's eyes, from an eternal perspective. Last week we looked at Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, where Paul says, I've learned to be content in all situations with whatever I have, whether I'm hungry or whether I'm full, whether I have lots or whether I have nothing, I've learned to be content. Do you know when Paul wrote that? He wrote that when he was sitting in prison. He didn't write that when he's on top of the world. That's easy to say that then. But when he's sitting in prison, he's saying God is always good. God is always faithful. So part of overcoming this envy is to change our perspective. The second thing I see here in Jonathan is that he is content. Maybe I'm the next king. Maybe I'm not. If it's me, I'm good. If it's David, I'm good. He's content. And he's kind. And he's thankful. He's genuinely excited about what David is experiencing. He's genuinely excited that God is pouring into David and all these things are going great, even though it threatens his whole future. He's content and he's kind, and he's thankful. Instead of being ripped off, he sees the blessing in the hand of God in David's life, and he fans that fire. He's content in who he is. He's content of his life around him, and he honestly pours into what he sees God doing in somebody else. No envy, no competition. Let's jump in. Let's jump in. In God's work. Thankfulness diffuses envy. Because envy steals thankfulness. Envy blinds us to what we have and what we are thankful for. So thankfulness diffuses envy. Hope and freedom come when we see things through God's eyes, when we live life in perspective of that reality, not in the reality of lies. And if thankfulness diffuses envy, then kindness causes us to run in the opposite direction from envy. Thankfulness is the greatest tool that God has given us for fighting envy. The truth is God has blessed us so much. Envy gets our eyes off of that. So we all know those two opposites. On one hand, God, why? I don't get it. Why them? Why not me? It's so easy for others. It's so difficult for us. Or I can't sleep because of frustration and and tears. Maybe if we just kind of quietly close our eyes and start praying, listing things we're thankful for, my, my guess is you'd probably fall asleep before you could finish that list. Jonathan had every right to feel threatened, but chose thankfulness and chose kindness and contentedness. He chose to fan the fire of David's success. Envy will rob you of joy. Envy will grow like a monster, and it will take over. Envy destroys and kills life. So rewind 15 minutes or so. And I said, envy, often we think, well, that's just a little one. I can't handle that. That's not a big deal. It doesn't really do anything or go anywhere. Envy is the root to so many other things because it's, it's the little seeds that are planted that grow into monsters. But folks, there is a better way. 
getting our eyes off of ourselves and onto Jesus, to look and to see what he is up to, and to jump on board with that and throw my weight behind that. You want to find freedom? It's the same as when we talked about pride and when we talked about greed. Let's get our eyes off of our own wants, our own scarcity, and onto Jesus. Because you are a child of the King. And nobody can take that away from you. You have been blessed in so many ways. Our cups are not half empty. Our cups are half full. But when my cup is half empty, that perspective grows and festers and simmers. And then all of a sudden, my cup has never got anything in it. That lie sucks life dry. This sin of envy will destroy you. Don't play with fire. Understand it. And then examine ourselves. And even if it's the little piece, I talked last week about uh, the cancer that, um, that was, when they go in to remove the cancer and they even find the little bit that was hidden. That's what we got to do here. Could, there could be nothing else except that little bit that's hidden, but we got to find that and expose that and get that into the light and run to Jesus and find forgiveness and repentance and find freedom and find life. Let me give you a couple more scriptures. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 4, says this. This is the wisdom of Solomon. In Ecclesiastes, he's writing on his his, um, observations in the world. And this is what he says. He observed that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. And he, he calls that chasing the wind. Are we motivated to success? Are we motivated to have? Are we motivated to upgrade because of the people around us? Folks, that's envy. And that's a seed that will grow into a monster. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30 says, A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. You know what that says to me? That envy means my heart is not sound. It might be just that little thing. It's just envy. And it hasn't even grown. But that means a sound heart is life to the body. Envy is rottenness to the bones. In another translation, it says it's cancer. Jesus came that you could have life. In John 10.10, The thief comes to steal and to to destroy, right? Jesus said he came that we might have a life, abundant life, rich and satisfied. Our world lies to us with greed. Our world lies to us about pride. Our world lies to us about envy because in all of those things it says you can have joy. You can have peace. You can have life. And all of those things steal those things away. Find freedom. Find life when we surrender and trust in God and His way. Let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, Your Word is so crystal clear sometimes and often when it is, it cuts us deeply. God, help us to to understand this this little seed, this little root that grabs hold of us, as innocent as it might be, but that grows always into a monster. God, if we want to follow Jesus, we want to live your way. We want life. We want abundant life. We want to be rich and happy and full of joy. Father, help us to root these things out. Actually, better yet, would you root these things out in us? Expose them in us. Cause us to run to you. God, forgive us. Cleanse us. Make us new. Give us a new heart. 
God, give us the ability to genuinely be happy for people who get ahead of us. That we might find real joy in life because of you. In Jesus' name, amen.